Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling, saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country. And there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the slaves and asked what was going on. He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed a fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years, I have been working like a slave for you. I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. Do you ever wonder what it would be like to be God? You ever fantasize about having all power and all understanding to be able to decide what's right and what's wrong? I know I've often wished that I had the ability to, to know everything so I could always make the right decisions. Sometimes I've even wished I had the power to smite certain people. I've certainly dreamed about having the power to heal and lay hands on people who are suffering and alleviate pain immediately. Humans have often explored what it must be like to be God. We've created movies about it. You remember the old George Burns movie, Oh God and Oh God, You Devil? And I think John Denver was in that. And there were courtroom appearances where God was a wizened old comic who was kind of hard to pin down and prove. My favorite movie, though, is Bruce Almighty. You remember that one with Jim Carrey? Jim Carrey plays Bruce, who's kind of fed up with God. His prayers aren't getting answered the way he wants. He says, God, you're, you're not doing a good job. And God comes down and visits him in the person of, of course, Morgan Freeman. And Morgan Freeman says, you think you can do better, Bruce? And Bruce says, yeah, I do. So Morgan Freeman, as God, goes on vacation Bruce is in charge of everything for a while, and he starts getting all these prayer requests. My favorite scene is when he decides to convert the world's prayer request into email, <laughs> downloads them all, gets tired of answering each individual request, and decides, you know what, I can do better. Hits reply all and just says, yes. 
Don't we all wish God would always say yes to our prayers? Of course, chaos ensues. Everybody who prayed to win the lottery wins, like 10 cents. (laughs) Kind of disappointing. All of these movies, when they explore what God is like, they they kind of land on the idea that maybe being God is more complicated than we make it out to be. Maybe God should just be God and be in charge of what's fair and what's right rather than us. These questions of fairness, of what God is like, are at the heart of this parable that Jesus tells to the Pharisees and the scribes. Jesus wasn't what people expected him to be like. He taught with authority. He knew the scriptures backward and forward. He spoke about God and God's law and what was right and wrong. But he hung out with the wrong people. He didn't follow the rules. He would have dinner with Gentiles, something Jews weren't supposed to do. He ate with tax collectors who everyone regarded as the enemy. He even partied with prostitutes. And the holy people, the religious crowd, did not approve of how Jesus carried himself. And honestly, would we approve today? No. We wouldn't approve of Jesus hanging out with the enemy. If he was partying with prostitutes, there would be rumors, there would be investigations, and we religious people would have nothing to do with him. Jesus seemed so good But he wasn't like the religious people. He wasn't like good church folk. He didn't fit in. They wanted him to be more like them. You know, people who who keep their lives looking clean on the front, who keep their distance from sinners. So they grumbled that Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus responds with the greatest story ever told, the best parable in my mind. He weaves a story for these Pharisees and scribes that reveal the truth about humanity and tell us what God is really like. It's a story of three people, a dad, two sons, one younger, one older. It's a story of a family. But more than that, it's a story about us and about God. Ask yourself right now, who are you? In this story, whom do you identify with most? The younger son? The older son? The story starts with the younger brother asking his father for his share of the inheritance. Can you imagine going up to your parents and asking for your share of the inheritance right now? Can you imagine your children coming up to you and asking you for their share of the inheritance right now. If I asked my parents for my share of what I'm going to get when they die, I think they'd cut me out of the will right then. (laughs) And they'd be so disappointed in me that I would be so so callous and self-centered and entitled. They certainly wouldn't give me a penny. But in Jesus' story... The father divides up his property and he gives to the younger son his share of the inheritance. And we learn something about God here. God has given us free will. God has given us the ability to make choices. And more than that, God has given us the ability to misuse the gifts that he gives us. We talk about stewardship all the time in the Christian family The recognition that everything we have is a gift from God that we're responsible for, to use wisely. Our very lives are a gift from God that we're called to be good stewards of. Do we look at our lives as our own, that we get to do whatever we want with? Or do we recognize our lives as a gift of God and we use them in a way that aims to please our Father in heaven? Do we live our life in relationship with our father or apart from that relationship? The younger son left. Scripture says he went to a distant country, as far away as he could get. He left the family. He left his dad. He thought he could live life better if he were the one calling the shots. 
if he were the one making choices about what was good for him. Sleeping around, getting drunk, living for the moment, partying, hedonistic, pleasure-seeking. Some of us have tried it. Sounds good in theory. Maybe we experimented in our 20s with that kind of lifestyle. But if you keep going down that path, it leads to addiction, meaninglessness, depression, even poverty and hunger. And we know some of our family and friends, maybe some of our own children, have gone down that path, living for themselves, living for the moment, wasting the good gifts that God has given them. If we continue on that path, we end up in the pigsty, jealous of what's being fed to the animals. It's called rock bottom, and some of you have been there. Rock bottom is the result of our freedom when we use it apart from relationship with God. In the story, the young son realizes he's hit rock bottom, recognizes that he's made mistakes, poor choices, and he decides to try to make the best out of a terrible situation. He decides to apply for a position as a slave in his father's house, figuring it'll be better than eating the pig's food. If that were your son, and he came back after months or years of no contact, in tattered clothes, not one penny left from the inheritance that you had given him, what would you do if that son of yours came back? I'm not sure what I would do. But that's beside the point. What does God do when we repent and return to him? He comes running out to us like the father running out to his son. The son doesn't even get the apology all the way out before he's embraced in the father's arms. He tries to apply for this position as a slave but his father isn't listening. He says, get the robe, the best one, put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. He's a son again, a full heir, fully welcomed back into this family. The father doesn't lecture him, doesn't pour on guilt trips or tell him what his leaving has meant to the family, what it's cost him personally. No, the father kills the fatted calf. We don't have fatted calves today. We might have bottles of champagne that we've kept for special occasions. Expensive bottles. The father breaks that open, invites the friends and the family to a party at his house, and celebrates the son who has returned. The father who has lost so much already on the bad choices of his son spends even more to celebrate his return. All is forgiven. All is forgiven. And a party is thrown. That's what God is like. God is like a parent who loves his children and just wants them to be home, safe and sound in relationship with him. Goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden where God created us to walk in the garden with him, to be in relationship. God is willing to forgive anything, anything, no matter what it costs him, even as we know if it costs him his own death on the cross. But the story doesn't end there. There's still the problem of the older son who refuses to come into the party. He's appalled that there is even a party going on for the kid that wasted the inheritance, that abandoned the family, that left him to do all the work. Why does he get to live life any way he wants while I've been here doing what you're supposed to do, obeying the rules, working hard. Have you ever felt like that? Jealous of those who make every mistake in the book and seem to get off scot-free? How did you react when Jesse Smollett had all the charges against him dropped in Chicago? 
He had led the police on a wild goose chase, set up a hoax of a false hate crime. All charges dropped. How did you react? I found it ridiculous, shameful, an affront to justice, all of that. Would we have found more sympathy for him if he had apologized, shown remorse, admitted what he did? Maybe. Probably not. Those feelings of anger, of injustice, of the unfairness of the system, that's exactly how the Pharisees felt watching Jesus dine with tax collectors and sinners eating with them rather than condemning them for all the wrong stuff they've been doing. It's what the older son felt when he saw that his younger brother had returned and there was a party going on for him in his house. I know I identify with the older son way more than the younger son. I never got drunk in college. I didn't drink my first beer till seminary. All those future Lutheran pastors saying, try this, try this. (laughs) I didn't sleep around. I've always held down a job, paid my bills on time, never been in trouble with the government. I never left the church during those so-called college rebellious years. I've stayed faithful to God since I was a Christian. And so the temptation for me for older sons like me, is to begin to believe that I'm somehow deserving of God's favor, that I've earned it, that God owes us something for being good, right? Isn't that why we're good in the first place, so we get something in return? We older sons, we get full of ourselves. But our problem is the same as the younger son's problem. It just manifests differently. We are also separated from the Father, living life on our terms, thinking we know what's best, trying to win the game, trying to earn salvation. We are self-righteous, thinking that because we know the rules to the game, we can play it better than everybody else, that we can win, that we can be good enough to earn God's favor. And we love, we older sons, we love to measure ourselves against others. Why can't they live a good life like me? Why can't they make good decisions like I do? But we are revealed for what we truly are when we can't bring ourselves to celebrate the mercy that somebody else receives, somebody whom we think is undeserving. We can't celebrate because We see ourselves as deserving, and we think only the deserving should get the party. But until we recognize that we are as undeserving of God's grace as any sinner out there, we will continue to be separated from the Father. We will be like the scribes and Pharisees who grumbled and scoffed rather than celebrated God's amazing mercy, God's amazing grace. Jesus tells this story to the Pharisees that they might see what it's like to be God. That God wants his children together in his home, saved, celebrating the gift of love and family, of eternal relationship. God goes out to the sinner, like Jesus eating with the tax collectors and the prostitutes. And God goes out to the self-righteous, urging them to repent as well, trying to open our eyes to see every person as our brother, as our sister. Whom do you think it's harder to reach? Somebody who has hit rock bottom, has messed up their life, doesn't know where else to turn? Or the one who has lived a good life by the world's standards? and has come to believe that maybe they don't really need anybody's help. Whom is it harder to reach? Can you imagine what it's like to be God 
and want to reach them both? Is there anything God wouldn't do to bring all of his children back home? To bring us back to himself? Look again to the cross and see a father who loves his children so much that he would do anything to save us. If you're the younger son, it's time to repent. It's time to admit that living for yourself, living in the moment, is not serving you well. Repent and turn to the Father and see his arms wide open, offering forgiveness. He loves you and there's nothing that you have done that can separate you from God's love. Nothing. All is forgiven. Come home. If you are the older son, turn back from trying to save yourself. Recognize that you too are as undeserving as anybody else. That you need God's grace too. And turn to the Father and see his arms open wide. Willing to forgive everything. And bring you into the party. To celebrate his mercy. Come home. May we all learn what it is to be like God. To be the one who seeks out the lost. Who forgives the sinner. To have the heart of the father. Who wants nothing else than to see his children come home. Amen.